This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Healthy dogs. It's the healthy dog pod. Thank you to the sponsor of this season of the Healthy Dog Pod, Field Day. Field Day is an Australian-made and owned dog health and wellness brand that creates products to help your dog live the best and healthiest life, inside and out. Field Day has a range of whole food meal toppers that target the top four health concerns for dogs, joints, digestion, anxiety, and skin. They're also really easy to use. You simply add them to the food that your dog already loves. You can also look after your dog's skin and coat health with Field Day's brand new grooming range. Field Day also donates 1% of all online profits to Pets of the Homeless. This is a charity that works to help keep vulnerable people and their pets together by alleviating the burden of providing essential pet care during times of hardship. You can shop the Field Day range online now at fieldaypet.com.au and use the code HDP10 for 10% off site-wide. That's HDP10 for 10% off. Now it's time to get to the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. It's Sophie and Ian, as always. And today we have an exciting guest. We have Nick Vanderon. Hey, Nick. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. That's good. Thanks for coming on today. Do you just want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. I guess most people know me um, either as the expert dog trainer on Amazon Prime Videos, The Pack, or I have a podcast um, called Dog Talk with Nick Benger. And um, I mostly talk about engagement with dogs. So that's getting your dog interested in you instead of the environment. But also I work a lot with dogs that are aggressive and reactive. That's awesome. That was, uh, the podcast is what uh, drew me to you originally, listening to you and getting all of those brilliant guests on that thing has been uh, such a great tool for so many people. And then the more I learned about you, like learning about, I really liked the way you talked about how engagement is king and your take on that. I'd love to just, yeah, if you can just unpack that a little bit for more for us, mate, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So uh, when I first started dog training, you know, like everyone, people, you know, initially um, they're trying to solve the problem of recall training. Like it's a really common inquiry that we get. So I was teaching loads of dogs to come back, but then, I, you know, I was kind of frustrated with the re- results. I found that uh, a lot of dogs, were, even if you have a good recall, you, have, you get a dog that comes back, but then instantly runs off again. So you just end up spending your whole time just constantly calling the dog back to keep them close to you, which isn't really a result. So I kind of realized that the problem isn't just that the dog doesn't want to come back, it's that they're running off in the first place. Like there isn't that connection with the person to want the, them to stay close. And I think for a lot of dog trainers, that probably comes quite naturally, like to in, want to encourage the dog to um, be close to you. But for a lot of dog owners, it's totally different. They're on their phone or they're just not paying attention to the dog. And the dog realizes pretty quickly that they're not a source of reward or a source of entertainment. And instead, just to look for that in the environment, right? So you get dogs that they turn up at the dog park and their first reaction is to kind of scan for other dogs, to scan for picnics, to scan for people, you know? So um, in order to combat that, what what I started doing was rewarding behaviors that we associate with, uh, well, engagement, right? Associate with wanting to hang out with the person. And the most obvious one for that is uh, what most people call a check-in. And that's when the dog actually turns and pays attention to the person. So at its absolute core, um, just, you know, as, as the foundations, rewarding the check-ins are, are really pivotal and make a massive difference in themselves. There's other things that you can do, like really just um, playing more games with your dog. And like, I think everyone's looking for like, certain, you know, they want you to tell them the, the games to play with their dog. And, um, you know, we do do a little bit of that, but really it's not about the game. It's about doing something with your dog. So, um, so there's a combination there. There's 
playing games more with your dog and rewarding the check-ins. And ideally, doing both at the same time is even better. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, so many people, when they take the dog outside the house, it's almost like a switch goes into their head and it's like they forget about themselves in the situation and they, they have it in their head that, okay, this is time for the dog and the world. And then we get the phone call because they're like, well, the dog didn't come back. But did you ever really value yourself in that conversation? And have you ever taught him that you are worth paying attention to? Because for me, it's like, like, like you said, like for, for dog trainers, I think it's probably natural to think, right, I'm going to hold the dog's attention and then give the dog back to the world. Whereas dog owners have got that in reverse and giving the dog to the world and then scrambling to get them back to come back to them when they when they want them yeah so you yeah sorry go ahead no 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 absolutely go ahead yeah you you know you want to keep the dog guessing about what you're going to do next you know you want them to constantly well not constantly but but be looking back frequently like what they're about to do right um keeping them in that that state of engagement is really important and you do get to a point so in you kind of alluded to there, like you do want the dog to experience the world as well. And you definitely do. Um, and, and I tend to think about it, you know, like you're kind of surfing a wave of engagement, right? And you, you want the dog to be engaged enough that um, they're responsive to when you call them back and that they're not really going too far from you. Personally, I don't want a dog that is just going to stare at me the entire time I walk around the park um, <laughs> because... It, if I get that, then um, while that might, you know, seem great, the dog's not really experiencing the world. Um, and, and that's, you know, not ideal for me. I mean, that's kind of like where we delve more into obsessional behavior, right? Where the dog's not experiencing the sense. They're not saying hello to other dogs. Um, but to be honest with you, I find that like that's a much rarer problem. Yeah. You know, and I'm sometimes... Dog tra- like this is where like dog trainers and dog owners divide because dog trainers will obsess over problems that are rare, right? You know, like <laughs> a lot of dog uh, dog trainers are like never play with a um, ball with your dog and stuff like this, right? And and the reason that they say that is because they're worried about ball obsession, but but um, disengagement with the owner is a much much more prevalent issue than ball obsession and we can prevent against ball obsession by using balls to reward the dog for the behaviors we like and not just turning the ball into the entire activity across the whole walk um so sometimes dog trainers have a habit of like throwing the baby out with the bath water you know whereas they there's like a a problem so it's like okay well we're just going to not do any of that um which isn't particularly helpful yeah, it's like tug of war. Like some dog trainers are out there going, don't play tug of war because your dog will practice all of the unwanted behaviors. It's not, I agree. It's like, find, practice practice the game in a really healthy manner and it becomes a part of your toolkit, um, not something your dog is going to weaponize against you. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I completely agree. And that, that's something I get really similarly. We'll, we'll teach people, especially like, well, we work with similar cases. I think the three of us here actually work all together in really similar cases. So we'll apply that logic to new dog owners where we really want them to build a relationship because you don't know your dog yet and you want yeah. them to learn, form that foundation. But it relates really heavily as well to our aggression work. And when we're working with reactive dogs, because quite often there is that disconnect there. So how might you how might you apply it in those circumstances, mate? Yeah, so I mean, I started off using engagement for recall primarily, but then I realized that it had knock-on benefits for the rest of the dog's life. And I, there's a book um, called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and he uses this term, uh, keystone habits, yes. which are like habits that you establish in your life, which have knock-on effects across your whole life, right? So if you eat better, then people that eat better tend to also exercise and blah, 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 right? It just has knock-on benefits when you get one thing right. And I kind of feel like that is the case with engagement with dogs and their owners. So I started off doing the recall training and then I realized that, okay, well, actually this is having benefit on lead walking and it's having a benefit on reactivity and so on and so forth. And then that kind of took me towards reactivity stuff. And now that's 
pretty much all that I do outside of our classes. Um, so to answer your question though, how does it benefit? Well, there's a whole like philosophy of overcoming um, reactivity training, which I realized after I kind of stumbled across that called look at me training. And sometimes it gets abbreviated to LAM. Yeah. Um, and essentially it is what it sounds like, right? When your dog sees the uh, trigger, so whether that's dogs to other people or, or whatever, um, you're, you're waiting for the dog to turn to you and then you're rewarding them. And I know instantly some people are gonna be like, well, my dog never turns to me. He's, this, he's is what <laughs> this, this is where distance really matters. And this is yeah. why um, actually employing a professional dog trainer can be, be a real help, even if you know what you're doing, because um, what you really want is a professional trainer that can set up situations for you, right? So when I'm working with clients, let's say I'm working with a dog that's dog reactive, yeah. I'll bring a dog, I'll have the dog at a distance far enough away that your dog isn't reacting um, but they are alert they are aware that the dog's there right so the dog gets aware of the other dog we wait sometimes it can take 30 seconds sometimes it can take a minute and then as soon as they turn away we're rewarding them and then um, through practice that gets quicker and quicker and quicker we're, we're able to reduce the distance until you're able to walk past another dog and then our whole dynamic shifts from um from the look at me stuff more towards re-socialization. Uh, so instead of thinking about distance, we're thinking about duration, right? So it's like, okay, I'm not worried about being two meters away. Now I'm now I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna let the dogs interact for two seconds, then three seconds, and four seconds, and five seconds, and so on, until we've cured the reactivity. Um, obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but that is a really quick overview. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually a pretty cool <laughs> breakdown. It's, it is a cool breakdown like um yeah, like for, for somebody that might you know from the outside looking in go all right well where the bloody hell how the hell do we get to there you know that's a pretty good breakdown you start with building up your engagement you start practicing that at distance you start closing the gap and then you start increasing the time around it it but it is not you can't get there without that foundation work if you don't have that relationship with your dog where they know that you're going to be there to help them out that you're going to you know support them that you're going to spend spend that time conditioning like positive associations and things like that then yeah, yeah i think we get so many calls going like in the first session you know, from a reactive dog let me show you him react it's like no man like I've seen loads, like loads of dogs barking at other dogs. I don't need to see yours do that as well. I think um, people go like think we believe them. That's why they're like, "Oh, can we meet at the park so I can show you?" It's like we don't want your dog to be in that stressful situation. We're actually trying to avoid that stress and you know gradually bring them closer. That's the one thing that I find a lot of and in same Nick, you probably get the same. Is people like, "Let me show you." I'm like, "No, I don't want to see. I don't want to see that happen." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you know, like this, it like that protocol kind of changes quite a bit if um, if we realize that the dog is reacting out of frustration. So we were kind of talking about this before we started recording. Yeah. Um, because the motivation behind the reactivity, maybe I wouldn't say it changes what you do, but it kind of changes the priorities a little bit, right? So. The two most common reasons for, re for reactivity are fear and frustration, at least in the dogs that I work with. So um, I tend to focus more on those because there are other reasons your dog could be reactive. But again, it's a much bigger minority. Yeah. So if you're working with a dog that is fearful, um, you know, the look at me training is probably going to be your number one priority right at the beginning. Um, maybe you can do some parallel walking. So parallel walking is where it is kind of what it sounds like, right? You're walking parallel to another dog, but at a distance at which your dog isn't reacting. And then over the course of the walk, you're trying to reduce that distance. So you're getting closer and closer and closer together, um, provided that your dog is, is happy with that. And, and that is um, more of like a desensitization approach. Um, and, and those two things for me are huge. Those are the two main exercises that, that we need. Um, there is other stuff you can do, obviously, but those, those really form the basis for me personally um so 
Uh, so with the the fear stuff, the look at me training is probably your 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 biggest thing. If you can do some parallel walking, fantastic. But you might find your dog is so reactive in the beginning that they just can't cope with that. Yeah. But it changes entirely if we're talking about a dog that is frustration reactive, right? Because uh, and what I mean by that is your dog just wants to go and say hello, but they're so frustrated at not being able to do that that they um they start reacting. And oftentimes people with dogs that have frustration reactivity find themselves in this catch-22 of the dog is reacting uh, therefore they can't interact with dogs but because they can't interact with dogs the dog is even more worked up because they're not kind of fulfilling that social need that they have um so some in, in some cases when the dog is really frustrated the main priority really is just getting them to be socializing again because if you do that oftentimes it reduces reactivity a lot because that dog that's been fulfilled in the dog. Uh, and then the whole look at me stuff becomes like a million times easier um, because you've you've fulfilled that need. And therefore the parallel walking is, could be the most important thing in the beginning. Um, or even with some dogs, um, even literally just going up to other dogs. Um, but really, again, that's why you need a dog trainer because they're gonna need to bring dogs that you can do that with. Because when you go to the park and your dog is screaming and shouting, no one wants your dog anywhere near them. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I've had a few. I've had a couple of these cases myself recently, and what we're seeing is because uh, we live in quite a dense city, Nick, and it's um, we're seeing a lot of leash for leash reactivity, um, and that tends to be that frustration uh one where the dog is reactive on leash but actually relatively social uh off leash but quite often the and this where this this is where for me it all ties together right so quite often the owner in this situation is taking the dog to the park and treating them like a bow and arrow just firing them off because their whole intention for that dog is to go and see other dogs so they are encouraging the dog to from a distance, like get to the park, snap the lead off, run off, go and see dogs. And that seems to be what the dogs practiced at the sight of dogs. Then when they're walking down the street, the dog goes to practice the same behavior and gets restrained and is all of a sudden in a really heightened state of arousal, starts barking and lunging and we get a phone call. They're really concerned that their dog is super aggressive. And at this point they've potentially stopped taking him to the park because they're worried about what he might do to other dogs. So- yeah, exactly. In a situation like that, you know, we, we go in and assess it. Like the last thing we want to do is tell anybody to let the dog off lead if it's going to go ruining other dogs' days. But if, if, we, if we think it's frustration and we think it's going to be social and after we've tested that a little bit, we go, do you know what? I'm going to give you a plan where it's not all about dog training. I want you two or three days a week to just alleviate your dog stress, take him off the lead, let him play with dogs, do some engagement training while he's off the lead, you know, start mm. off the walk with your engagement and working with him and giving him cute social cues to, yes, you can go off and see that dog. But yeah. when you're, and when you're working with him on lead, we're not aiming for other dogs yet. So this is not a walk anymore. This is a training session where you're building your engagement skills on lead so that we're setting the foundation so that in the future, yeah, you can go for a leash walk, you can have your cake and eat it, but you've actually built up all of those skills you need to be able to get your dog in a position where he's responsive to you, but also not just such a pent up ball of emotion because he hasn't been able to say hello to a dog for a few weeks. Yeah, this is the nuance of each case, Ian. It's like, that's why you, you take each one and you, you know, maybe slightly adjust to what your plan is because uh, oftentimes the frustration reactive dogs I've seen, like, people have had that thought where they're like, oh, wow, like, is my dog aggressive towards other dogs? And they haven't let their dog greet another dog for like eight months. And then it's just really built up to the point of, you know, ridiculousness. And the priority for those dogs is just getting them around dogs again. But, um, you know, what you were saying where if a dog's got a, like a, like actually it has a social life, right? And it is interacting with dogs on a frequent basis. And then when you have them on the streets and you have them on the lead, they're basically they're just more like whining and complaining that they can't go and say hello. Then the look at me training is going to be the priority, definitely. So, so this this is the nuance of of just working with dogs, really. 
yeah. yeah. I really enjoy the, um, once we've got a look at me, I really enjoy the look at, look at me, look at that game. So adding that layer in of, yeah, go and have, a, actually queuing them up. Go look at that dog, mate. And they go, <laughs> and then they check back in with you. I, I really enjoy just that, that level of engagement with uh, the client gets, just being able to, because so often the client is communicating to us their concern is effectively their perception of like their lack of control over the situation. And we don't want people to be manhandling and taking all that physical control, but having a verbal relationship with your dog where you can quite literally go, hey man, do you wanna look at that? Good, that's great, well done. Do you wanna look back at me? Just being able to have a really strong connection through solid communication skills with your dog. So even, even before I started looking into dog training, when I heard about recall, it, for me, it didn't have much to do with, or it wasn't just solely about come back to me. I even, this is before any formal study whatsoever, I broke recall down into five sections and now I'm going to struggle to remember them. It was, <laughs> it was, it, I broke it into something like as simple as come here, stay there, okay, go um there was uh, like a cue like sta station training like go to, go to bed i can't remember what I the other one was telling me about these you've written it down before yeah i, I plugged it into our copy school. yeah but um that was before any formal study it felt like common sense to me um and yet when so many people are talking about recall they just want the dog to just come back quickly and then they snatch the dog. <laughs> they don't really have any element of that control over the situation. Yeah, that's why I've been so passionate about this, Ian, because um, I feel like as dog trainers, we spend so much time doing recall training and so little time talking about engagement. And that's so backwards because if you, if you have a dog that's engaged with you on a walk, you, that will solve so many problems. Like, the, the, it's it's that keystone habit thing again where it's like if you just have that that makes a huge difference and oftentimes when we're working with clients we really do have to prioritize the things that are going to make the biggest difference um so it was just like it's a point of frustration for me that it's not spoken about enough but as you were talking then um there are a few like parallels in in uh, what we're talking about which we didn't I, or i at least didn't really explain um, so there's the automatic check-in, which is really what we're talking about with the reactivity, but does apply to recall as well, or just generally having a well-behaved dog. And, and what I mean by that is you're teaching the dog that the distraction is the cue to pay attention to you, right? So if you see another dog, that is the cue to pay attention to, to us, right? And again, that is where we're waiting for the dog to turn to us, then we're rewarding them, right? <laughs> what a lot of um, owners do is, they, the dog sees another dog and then they go, look at me, focus. Yeah. And unfortunately, you're you're robbing the dog of the opportunity to learn that the, the distraction is the cue to pay attention to you. And that is so magical. That is like such a change. When you go to the park and the distractions are actually signals to the dog to pay attention to you, like that is a total game changer. Okay. And then the other thing you said about the look at that, um, I use the words go play, which I think you kind of said as well. So, for example, like when this is a bit more established, this might be a typical scenario. The dog sees another dog. They look back at me. Then I say, OK, go play. Right. And then they run over and play. Right. So the reward for looking back was the uh, permission to go and play with the other dog. Right. Um, so, you know, the, that's that's really. Uh, yeah, that makes a huge difference. I think the, the most, the easiest, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like crossover into like human world. Okay, so I remember as a kid going into a shop with my parents and if I saw sweets or something I liked, my parents did a fantastic job and they'll probably tell you otherwise. But I remember having really good what we consider manners and going, mum, can I have that but what they did was essentially what we're talking about i 
I never just well, I did probably, but like <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't what they were trying to get was not for me to not just rush up to the sweets and take them. Yeah. And sometimes mum would go, not today, mate, sorry. But she would like she would say it in a manner like yeah, we can do that later. And it was engaging. And like, I just, I'm sure, like, again, I'm going to tell you that I was an angel child and I never threw a tantrum. But like, but sometimes she'd go, yeah, you can take one or what, you can go and take two. But what she's doing is exactly what we're talking about is asking for that. I, I hate using the term manners, but that's essentially what it is. Like, hey, can I go and do such and such a thing? And what that does for the dog owner, it gives them in these situations that are often so busy and so like can be so overwhelming for the dog owner, it gives them a, a breath and go, do you know what? Yeah, you can. Or no, actually that dog over there is a bit of a goose. I probably shouldn't let you go off the lead right now. It yeah. allows, it puts them in a position of being able to take responsibility for their dog's behavior. That's a really, really nice analogy. And I, I really like that. And, and also dogs don't understand that that dog over there is wearing a muzzle and has a massive sign on them saying stay away, right? Like the, dog, <laughs> the dogs don't understand that. That's why we need to have the, the uh, control to be able to say, okay, not that dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, why that's important. It is. And, you know, even just on a baseline level, we, we know and, and as professionals, so many of us know that, we shouldn't just be letting dogs rush up to others in their face anyway. It's going to cause so many weird, awkward social situations. And so having that as a baseline skill of going, your dog indicating to you, hey, dad, there's a dog over there. You've got, it, it, I feel like for this to become achievable across the board, people need to be aware that it's actually normal to not approach every single dog um, and having that check-in as an alternative because that means you get to go yes or no and that covers your ass <laughs> it covers your ass so much i know my dogs will not appreciate another dog just coming up to them on the footpath like um yeah. it's it's rude and confrontational so again it's setting them up for success and at the end of the day, we're then taking responsibility for what, for the social interactions that our dogs have by not throwing them in the deep end and asking them to, yeah, see how it goes, mate. Like you get to go and say hello to everyone. You'll win some, you lose some. We go, yeah, that one's a goose. Let's not, let's not go near him. And sure, you might, you might not, well, you won't interact with every single dog, but that's normal. I don't interact with every single person I see. I'd be really bloody weird if I did. <laughs> yeah, it's you're right you know we have kind of normalized like you know this behavior of just running up to every dog and really it's not very natural even for dogs you know like you know when mm. you see the street dogs they're not like sprinting up to every dog like trying to play with them right uh it's it's much more like people it's just like you know just crossing paths um yeah. sure they might form a relationship with another dog and then want to play with them but they're not just like sprinting up to random dogs and like going full tilt but we've kind of normalized that we have like <laughs> most dogs that they come across are strangers and acquaintances so like to go up to a stranger and acquaintance that intensely it i think is setting like if we're allowing that we're the ones actually setting our dogs up for failure and so I, it goes back to like what we touched on right at the start as to why engagement is important and what we really what i'd love people to take from this is to go really value your connection with your dog um to set them up for success and really just make sure that you are taking responsibility for what situation they're in and at the same time it's a lovely way to build your relationship it's such a oh, yeah. the best part yeah i don't think there's anything better personally yeah i think it really does build relationship because uh your dog is learning that you're the source of, of good things, right? And like a really kind of like scientific and not um, not very emotional view of relationship is that relationship is really just um, positive emotions, like positive, like 
creating positive association with someone right and I know that that kind of sucks the joy out of relationships <laughs> but, but like, that's what an engagement is about right like you're, yeah. the dog is every time they pay attention to you on a walk something good happens right like you're you're, you're building a, a really strong relationship yeah it's funny isn't it I think I think so many dog owners don't actually realize uh how much science a dog trainer will actually look into and we all seem to really enjoy that side of things but that that is something that we all have in common and we do look at it sometimes through that quite clinical lens but we are building just positive associations and the dog is going to do what it values most and if it's you if it really wants to engage with you then uh then they will do it more often and i heard you speaking before um as well nick and i'd love to just get your take on this and how this applies as well you sum this up really well for me uh not for me but for a lot of people on one of your episodes um uh talking about reinforcement history so i think you were using your little dog's example about chasing squirrels yeah sure yeah <laughs> yeah i think this is um it might have been the conversation i had with kathy murphy and um uh kathy like does a much better job of explaining the science behind it than i can um but basically uh, i've got a little terrier that loves chasing squirrels so um but what one one kind of what i always do on top of the recall is what we call the emergency uh, whistle recall and that is the simplest dog training you could ever do it's just blowing the whistle and then giving dog the some giving the dog something that is extremely high value to the dog so in the uk i don't know if you have this there but i use primula cheese a lot do you have primula cheese it's like squeezy cheese um, oh, squeezy cheese yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um uh, also, you can get like meat paste and stuff like that, but those yeah. tend to be very high value for the dog. But feel free to adjust it depending on you know what your dog's into. So I literally just blow the whistle, give the dog some squeezy cheese, do that three times a day for about a month, and you end up with a really solid response to the whistle. And it's purely conditioning. We're not what? worried about getting the dog to come to the whistle or anything like that. That comes naturally as a as a result of having done the conditioning. So. Yeah. Um, so on the podcast, we're having a conversation about there's been many times where I've called my dogs off things that uh, are more valuable than the cheese itself. Right. So like with my terrier, he would much rather chase squirrels than get cheese. Like there is no competition, but he will respond to the whistle, uh, mm -hmm. come back and get the cheese. And so I was asking Kathy about that because, and, and you know, what she was saying is that I hate explaining this because I feel like I do a terrible job, but like the, <laughs> the brain chooses the, the strongest like neural path, right? Um, so if you, because we've done so much repetition with the whistle and then the reward, that neural pathway is really, really strong. And so when like, when you get those two stimuli happen at the same time, yeah. um, Oftentimes you'll get the the dog will do the recall because you've built such a strong um, pathway and such a strong association with the dog that even though there's more of the reward, uh, more of uh, a more rewarding thing that you still get the recall. And, um, you know, I've done that time and time again. We've recalled dogs off of sheep with the emergency whistle. Building that strong association makes a huge, huge difference. But um, where people tend to get it, there are a couple of things that people tend to do that kind of uh, they they get it wrong. So either they start practicing the whistle with distractions, or they start trying to do recall with the whistle um, instead of just purely building association. Or sometimes people get to the point a couple of weeks in where the whistle becomes so effective they just start whistling all the time. And yeah. and the problem is that because the whistle works on association the more opportunity that you present for the dog to hear the whistle and not come back, especially in the early stages, um, the more opportunity you are introducing for that association to start to break down. And the reason it's so effective is because you're getting whistle reward, whistle reward, whistle reward. And uh, so it's, it's absolutely like crucial that you, uh, you maintain that kind of one-to-one uh, -one response. So with the emergency whistle, 
are you sure. if you don't use it you know say you haven't done it in a few months or whatever and then you use it do you find that the dog will come back to it or are you kind of like training it every so often as well just to make sure it's still valuable yeah i don't know what the science is behind that but i think that if you don't use it for a long time it does weaken in my experience so usually what i i suggest to people is they do it three times a day when they're training it for about the first month and then you just do it a couple of times a week just whistle reward um just to maintain that um association if you have a dog that really loves their dinner um then you can do it with that as well so you can blow the whistle then give the dog dinner but if you have a dog that's picky about their food then i i wouldn't do that yeah it's got to be it's got to be a really really like you said that reward has to be really high value because what what we're competing with in your example for for example is a dog whose genetic history says chase that squirrel <laughs> and that is a really deep rooted uh, driver for that dog to be alive <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Yeah. and we are aiming for a reinforcement history that outweighs that and yeah. it, it's not impossible it's sure like it, it it's not there it's like you, I think you summed it up so well it's not there to be used day in day out we don't want to take him down to chase squirrels to use the whistle every single day you're just going to fail at some point but to have that in the bank i've used it in the past i really yeah the same the same principle um with a client that lived uh on a really large patch of land and she just needed her dogs to she it wasn't very often but she needed her dogs to come back but for, other than that they had free reign and so we just hung a whistle by the by the back door. And for that for that month, it was three times a day, blow the whistle while the dogs are there. Straight, 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 straight. Blow the whistle, straight, 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 straight. After a while, we got to a point where she could just walk outside, boop, and these dogs would come from everywhere. And it was so effective because for, for them, it didn't matter what they were doing, they were about to get the best part of their day. And yeah. It was, it's just, it's just like you said, it's just basic reinforcement um, conditioning, but there are some rules around it. I don't know, like you can't, you, you've got to, you've got to actually understand those laws of conditioning to be able to do it effectively. Um, so yeah, that's where getting some help uh, with those little details can go a long way. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that is really interesting as well is if you have multiple dogs, it helps, I think, to uh, introduce an element of competition. So, uh, for example, if you're using food, it's great if you have multiple dogs. I mean, you have to make sure that they're not dogs that are going to scrap over food. If they're not the sort of dogs that are going to fight over food, yeah. then, you know, you blow the whistle, take a load of treats and just scatter them along the floor, right? Yeah. Now, when you have to use it for real, you introduce a, an element of competition there because w whichever dog gets back first is going to get more of the food. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, so, yeah, that's, that can be really effective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that, and, and just to play devil's advocate as well, I have seen somebody take that so far that one of the dogs learned that it wasn't valuable to turn up at all. So you still need to make oh, sure that you reserve enough food for them. <laughs> you just like, like, I'm too I've sorry. never had that happen before, but I, I guess, yeah, that could, that could, happen yeah i've never had that happen before but i could see where that could happen yeah if you had a really fast dog and a really slow dog yeah that's exactly why it happened he's gonna I, get there yeah it's just like he heard the whistle and he just started to see his mate just overtake him and he go oh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know one thing with this as well is like i don't want to paint it as like a miracle cure because you know you were talking about uh like genetics of like a terrier, for example, mm -hmm. and um, with the different breed types, it's in, one thing that's worth thinking about is um, whether those breeds' hunting patterns have been bred to be interrupted, right? So, for <laughs> example, with a, with a spaniel, you uh, you know, if you're working a spaniel, you need to be able to interrupt them when they're hunting, right? Because maybe you're going to shoot the bird or, or whatever, right? So that that ability to be interrupted has um, <coughs> been established in their genetics. With a dog like, um, I don't know, like a Saluki or something like that, or a Terrier, 
when you're hunting with those dogs, you never interrupt them, right? It's like when the terrier is chasing a rat, you never say stop, right? So there's never been a, like a, a part in their breeding where we've bred them to be able to stop mid, um, yes. mid predatory sequence. So like that makes that tougher. Uh, but I do think the emergency whistle is the best shot we have. Um, so yeah, try and get that right from the beginning. The other thing that is really frustrating as a as a dog trainer is when people call you up and they're like, oh yeah, you know, um, I've been uh, letting my dog hunt in the woods for like three or four months now. Now it's starting to become a problem. And it's like, <laughs> it's going back to that, that, that like neuroscience perspective. It's like, you've let that habit become so established in the dog by just taking them to the woods and letting them hunt for months on end that you've made your path towards engagement so much harder, yeah. so much harder. So, um, you know, if I was to take on like a pointer or something like that now from a, from a young age, I would be trying to prevent that um, urge from developing more than it has to. It's gonna develop anyway, because that's what the dog's bred to do, but I'm not gonna take them to the woods and let them hunt for hours. Right? Yeah. Instead, I'm gonna be working on the opposite. I'm gonna be working on engagement from a young age um, so that I have, you know a fighting chance against that yeah and that's i think you know a couple of things to raise there like the combination of the two things we've really emphasized today the the engagement is is so important just to have that foundation but then when you do lose your dog's attention which will happen you yeah. you can also you've always so got a you can practice that emergency whistle so so it's there like if you need it um and like it's funny because we don't we don't get over here uh, we don't get many people uh in sydney having access to woods to let their dogs hunt but we will see the oh, okay. similar um <laughs> a similar issue manifest in a completely different way where they will create these uh they'll tap into that predatory sequence through ball ball play and they will create an absolute monster of a dog that cannot do anything other than ball play. Mm. And, but that, that is tapping into that like chase sequence. And yeah. it is so endorphin releasing. And of course, when we're dealing with dogs that are generally that kind, that way inclined with a high, like uh, that predatory sequence and quite high arousal, they are, typically little dopamine addicts in the first place so if you give them something to cling on to like that they're always the one that just takes it runs with it like can't can't take a break from it and sure. the same principles as what you just talked about really do apply it's like yeah you are going to need to satiate that need um otherwise it's going to come out in other ways mm -hmm. but we also do need those skills to we don't, yeah, we don't want him to just practice ball play. Like the, the classic one's the border collie owner. He yes. just just constantly fetching the ball, fetching the ball, fetching the ball, fetching the ball. And they go, oh, he's never tired. Really? <laughs> like, he's like, you've never actually actually asked him to do anything other than fetch a ball. So we, yeah, we sure. see, see, see parallels. I used to like, I used to not advise people to play with balls with their dogs. Um, but then I came, I just kept seeing spaniels that, We'll get to like eight nine months and uh, become obsessed with hunting and the owners hadn't built any like they had no leverage right there was nothing that they could use that came even close to um that kind of frill so instead what we do now especially with spaniels because we get a lot of working spaniels so i know that there's going to be differences in like the dogs that we see you know like you were talking about the woods um, when we get the young working spaniels now um, we actually do what i i would highly encourage people to get them highly ball motivated. Um, but you need to know how to use the ball, right? Like yes. you don't let the ball become the entire walk. You use the ball to reward the behaviors you like, right? So when I'm out on a walk, the moment the dog turns back to me, it's like, yes, good. Then I throw the ball, right? Yeah. Or I do things like we're walking along, I'll drop the ball without the dog looking, walk on like 10 meters. And then the moment they turn to me like, yes, good, go find the ball, right? So. Um, instead of just throwing the ball the entire walk, you're actually yeah. rewarding them for the behaviors you like with the ball. Um, but you need to have in the dog the ability to switch off. 
from the ball. Oh, right? and that's the ask that. How do you get them to stop? Because you find those dogs that are just like, <gasps> yeah. Oh, that always comes about though from people that literally their whole walk is the ball and they build such an expectation that when we're going on a walk, like we're not even going on a walk, we're just going to throw the ball, right? And yes. that is the, the dog's expectation of what is about to happen. Um, so if you don't have that expect, if you don't build that expectation in the dog, then it's not a problem. And in fact, it's highly, highly beneficial with really working drive dogs to have that kind of leverage where you've, <clears throat> where you've built like high motivation for something like, it doesn't even have to be a ball, but we're just talking about balls. You know, it could be tug or, or whatever. But like you said earlier, Nick, like whatever you're using, whether that is your Primula cheese, your your treats for looking at you, your ball, your tug toy, every single one, it's not about that. It's about rewarding engagement. And yeah, that's totally. how we lose the dependency on that one item. And it becomes about communication skills and the relationship. And yeah, it, it, it circles back around to the original point of making sure that, you know, your relationship with your dog is really, really strong. Um, for, for so many reasons um, yeah sure yeah. yeah there's so many different ways you can re reward and you know even with like the toy or the the food like the way that you present those things makes a big difference as well you know with food the thing that everyone always does is just literally just puts it in the dog's mouth but but if you throw the the treat for some dogs that's going to add a an element of reward to it um you can also like it's quite hard to describe on a podcast, but if you kind of put the food between your thumb and your palm, you can kind of um, have the dog play chase with your hand to get the food. Um, so there's there's things that you can do to add value um, with with the reward. And when it comes to engagement, I tend to switch the reward quite a lot. You know, so um, maybe for the check-in, sometimes the dog's getting the ball, maybe they're getting tug, maybe they're getting food, and and any of those things could be presented in a variety of different ways there are so many games online especially like from the dog sports world to be honest like the dog sports people generally have like developed a lot of really fun little games you can play with your dog and the games don't really matter that much all that matters is your dog enjoys them and you're using them yeah. to reward the things that you like yeah i really enjoy um uh cray over your neck of the woods craig ogilvy for that I think totally. he's got some, uh, some great stuff on his YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was, again, like listening to him on your podcast with somebody um, I really, really resonated with, just his uh, attention to detail when it came to how important play is was something I really, I, I absolutely loved. It was, I because I grew up, like, not training dogs with food. I grew up training dogs um or playing with dogs and engaging with them and then and then i had to go and learn about motivating them with food so for me it did come quite naturally and listening to that chat and those sort of conversations really did feel like second nature because yeah. yeah it just felt like that that was that felt like common sense to me <laughs> but yeah. yeah it's frustrating sometimes like i work with dog owners sometimes that have such a um negative view of training like they think that it is like they treat it like it's a chore right yeah. like oh you know like oh how long am i gonna have to do this for um you know like they, they the mindset is totally wrong and i think that that's one of the things that dog training has historically gotten wrong is we haven't really like been able to communicate that to dog owners well enough that like training should really just be like you said Ian just playing with your dog yeah right like when I'm when I'm doing especially engagement training like when you are doing engagement training with your dog to me that is not a chore at all I'm literally just going on a walk I'm playing with my dog I'm just playing strategically <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> right like yeah. instead of just playing like with no contingency whatsoever like I'm playing um with the dog the moment they turn to me right it's just I'm just but it's your just, dog is too this is what gets me like your dog <laughs> is playing strategically too it, both, <laughs> both of you are trying to win the game whether you like it or not yeah. but some some people just seem to give that up way too easily <laughs> yeah no it's really it's no great chore to me to um 
to to do the engagement training with dogs honestly just playing with them really but just playing at the right moments um and and uh yeah that's funny like ian because um like a lot of people say that uh i can't remember the phrase for it now someone probably came up with it but it's like you know the dog probably thinks they're training you it's like every time i look back at this guy <laughs> you know i get a treat or i get a game or whatever <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, that I think that's actually really important to kind of acknowledge. Like, you, we want to make, we want to empower our dogs. Like, we want to empower um, any learner to to feel that way, so that they're enjoying the this the activity that they're they're taking part in. Because if your dog believes he's training you, he there is not a single thing on this earth that doesn't love winning. <laughs> so if your dog is convinced that this is working out just the way I want it and it happens to be convenient for you too then there are no losers yeah and we're always told you know like traditionally people there was always this adversarial relationship with their dog where it's like you know you can't let them win you can't let them think that they're controlling you blah 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 and actually um i think more modern dog training is all about just having a um like a mutual relationship like a mutually beneficial relationship right and and if the dog is you want the dog to think that the stuff that you want them to do is the most profitable thing for them to do right like you want them and al almost you want them to think that it's their idea yeah definitely whereas like yeah, if I turn back to this if if I see a dog and then I turn back to this guy he's going to give me um the stuff that I want Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You want them to do it because they want to do it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Like not, okay. not because you forced them to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Like nobody want nobody put yourself in their shoes. How would you like to learn? Would you like to be motivated and felt like you were succeeding in everything you did, or would you want to consistently feel like you're being coerced into it? So yeah. no friend. <laughs> Mate, Nick, this Thanks. has been so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> thank you <laughs> it's nice to talk to people that get it i appreciate that <laughs> yeah likewise mate we uh we covered so many different things and i feel, i actually think today has been really nice to actually just get into that talk talk about dog training and like different aspects of it what we're using for success and why why some of these things work as well and um yeah hopefully hopefully people are really going to take a lot from today so Really appreciate your time today, mate. Thank you. Yeah, that would be awesome. Awesome, mate. Well, yeah, we will love to speak to you soon, and uh, we'll see you all very uh, well. We'll see you all next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healthy Dog Pod. We know we did. Thank you again to our sponsor, Field Day, for making this season of the Healthy Dog Pod possible. And remember, folks, a healthy dog's a happy dog. Woo! And that was the pod. I hope you.